and Dr. Shalendra Kumar Mahantar, Organizing Secretary for the International Webinar titled Chemopreventive Properties of Herbal Products in Cancer, Alpha Centralog, a case study and international opportunities for Indian pharmacy professionals. I welcome all the delegates for the international webinar. I would like to thank the management and the principal of Nirmala College of Pharmacy for providing me the opportunity to host the event. Due to the overwhelming response for the event, we have chosen to live stream the event through our YouTube channel in order to cover the maximum number of participants on a single platform. Now I would like to request the convener of our international webinar, Dr. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, to discuss about the significance and relevance of the international webinar. Sir. I am very much delighted and happy to share you that today we are organizing an international webinar in collaboration with Wikes University USA. On behalf of management, we are very much privileged to welcome you all for our international webinar to nurture and motivate the pharma professionals on advanced cancer research and to know about the scope and abroad opportunities. In this current scenario, the prevalence of cancer among world population is rising rapidly, especially prostate cancer in males and breast cancer in females. Herbal phytoconstituents play a major role in fighting against variety of cancers like vincristin, vinblastin, taxol derivatives, campotecan derivatives, etc. Today's webinar highlights the potential anti-cancer effect of alpha santalol, a key component of sandalwood oil. In addition to that, the same webinar will address the questions related to international opportunities for Indian pharmacy professionals. In this regard, I thank my dear friend and eminent professional Dr. B. Ajay Kumar, Associate Professor, Wikes University, USA, for accepting our invitation and delivering an excellent seminar. Hence, I congratulate all the staff, research scholars, student friends for being a part of this international webinar. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Dr. Sailendra Kumar Mahanta, President, Nirmala Innovation Incubation Center, to uh, invite guest speaker of international webinar. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to introduce the resource person for our international webinar, Dr. Ajay Bhumaredi. Dr. Ajay Bhumaredi has completed his postdoctoral fellowship from University of Pittsburgh, completed his PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences from South Dakota University and completed his B.Pharm from Nalagonda College of Pharmacy, Nalagonda, Telangana. He is currently working as Associate Pharm Professor of Pharmacology in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Nesbitt School of Pharmacy, Wikes University, Pennsylvania. His research focuses on cancer prevention and treatment, employing naturally occurring phytochemicals and chemotherapeutic agents. He is having 17 years of research experience working with various cancer types including colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, cell culture and animal models. He has to his credit more than 30 peer-reviewed publications in various journals. Now I would request Dr. Ajay Bhumaredi to move ahead with this session. Good evening everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening to talk to you about my research and past experiences. Um, I hope you're all doing good and staying healthy during these uncertain times and it is equally bad where I'm currently living, Pennsylvania. And you might be again getting all this information through news channels or social media, etc. Right. Before we jump into my, my talk, let me introduce to you about myself, my background, uh, where I'm from. I'm originally from Nunna, which is on the outskirts of Vijayawada, Andhra Pradesh. My family has a background in agriculture, and my father is a farmer who still, uh, you know, continue doing doing farming, especially with the mango gardens uh, we have in Nunna. Um, 
I completed my B Pharmacy from Nalanda College of Pharmacy, Usman University affiliation, located in Algonda, uh, currently in Telangana State, in 2000. And right after my graduation, I worked as a territory manager, which is equivalent to marketing manager for a multinational company, Nutritia India Private Limited. For about a year, from 2000 to 2001, right after graduation, I worked for about a year. But the reason why I wanted to come to United States is, um, ever since I was a student in, in, in the college, you know, while pursuing my bachelor's in pharmacy, I always had, I don't know what it is, but I always had this inherent interest in pharmacology. I wanted to do something related to pharmacology and pursue higher education in pharmacology. So that's what motivated me to apply to uh, uh, universities up in United States. And initially I did not get admission to PhD. I was admitted to a master's program. Later, my master's, uh, I convinced my, my thesis advisor to convert it to PhD, and that's how it got converted. And I completed my both my master's and PhD in five years from South Dakota State University, Brookings, located in South Dakota. Right after my graduation with PhD, I moved to University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, located in Pittsburgh, um, where I worked for two years, working on various cancer models, you know, dietary phytochemicals, uh, which I will be talking a little bit during my presentation. That experience really kind of paved me the way uh, to the research that I'm currently doing at Brooks University, focusing on the prostate and breast cancer models. So my current position, I started in 2009, and um, our, our university is primarily teaching oriented. It's not like a pretty research oriented uh, university or program. So we are involved with uh, PharmD curriculum. We teach PharmD students. We also have a master's program, but we primarily associated with PharmD. So you might be wondering uh, why I am here talking to you. Uh, how do I know uh, Nirmala College of Pharmacy? Um, I have great relation with Nirmala College of Pharmacy because uh, uh, Dr. Rahman, who is the principal of Nirmala College of Pharmacy, is a good friend of mine. We went to school college together during the pharmacy, you know, we had, you know, great moments. We share each other um, periodically. Whenever I visit India, I, and I, I try to uh, meet with him and my other colleagues and friends. So I was really, you know, intrigued with, uh, with, with what they are doing at Nirmala College of Pharmacy. And when Dr. Rahman approached me, I was very uh, happy. And I told him immediately that I would be more than happy to deliver a presentation focusing on my research and past experiences. So a couple of words of wisdom before I move to my presentation. Um, I would like you guys to follow what your gut says and believe in yourself, believe in your parents, you know, support from your parents and friends will always be helpful to achieve whatever you want to, you know, achieve in your life. So if you have some kind of goal or determination that you want to pursue, just keep in mind, follow the goal, no matter what hurdles you face, all these hurdles are not permanent, you know. Everyone has bad phases here and there. So it's that person who can overcome these bad phases will shine and achieve their goal. So do not ever uh, uh, kind of think that, think that, you know, you will not be able to um, reach the goal where you want to go. So believe in your teachers, you know, listen to your parents, uh, follow the gut, and, and again, always share your, your um, whatever you want to achieve with your parents, friends, and your, your teachers who are uh, teaching you in the college or wherever you go, whether you're working at a hospital setting or retail setting or in a pharmaceutical company, that will help you to achieve uh, wherever you want to go and, uh, you know, be successful in your life. So follow your gut and believe in yourself. Those are the two main things I would suggest to you. And that's exactly what I did. I followed my gut and I did tell my parents, even though they were not educated well enough to understand, you know, what is a PhD, what is a master's, I convinced them that I will be successful if they kind of, you know, help me uh, in achieving my goal. And they did listen to me. So indeed, parents always listen to us, uh, you know, in helping us to achieve where we want to go. So I will stop here and then we'll continue with our 
research talk. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ajay Bamaradi. Uh, I am currently working as an associate professor of pharmacology at Wilkes University, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. I am very delighted to be here to talk to you about my research and also uh, the opportunities that you can avail after completion of PharmD in the United States. Before I start, I would like to thank Dr. Rahman and Nirmala College of Pharmacy for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys and share my research experiences all these years. Um, I came to United States in 2002, and I received my PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from South Dakota State University and started working in my current position from 2009. So this is uh, my 11th year uh, in the academic um, environment. I really enjoy working with students, and uh, the best part is working with them in the lab, training the students with, uh, um, you know, the research techniques and working along on, on various projects. So my title uh, for today's talk is Chemopreventive Properties of Herbal Products in Cancer, uh, using alpha santalol as a case study. The reason is I've been working on this molecule for a little over, I should say, uh, 10 years, uh, especially focusing on prostate and breast cancers. Okay. Just to give you a brief background of where Wilkes University is located, and within the university, uh, our school is uh, Nesbitt School of Pharmacy. It is located, as I mentioned earlier, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. It is on the northeastern part of the state, almost uh, in similar to if you were to look at the geographical location uh, in the next slide. Um, our school offers programs in uh, PharmD, and we recently also started Masters in Pharmacology and Medicinal Chemistry program. We don't have any PhD program. Uh, we are hoping to recruit students for the master program pretty soon. In addition, our university also offers graduate programs in MBA, nursing, engineering, education and arts as well. So geographical location of our university, as you can see here, it's pretty close to major cities like New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia. Those are all uh, big cities which are like three to four hours you know, driving distance from uh, um, where, where we currently are in Pennsylvania. So my talk today will be focusing on brief background on cancer statistics, and I will be giving you an overview of what is chemo prevention and some of the herbal compounds, uh, again, the phytochemicals that you can typically see in various plant-based products. You might have learned a lot about uh, these medicinal plants in your pharmacognosy. We do not have a course uh, focusing on pharmacognosy uh, in, in our program, pretty much, I would say, throughout the United States, there is no designated uh, pharmacognosy course as such. It used to be there, but uh, I don't know why we don't have it anymore. But I do continue offering uh, a course focusing on phytochemicals role in health and disease. That's my elective, so it's not like a um, core course that everyone has to take it to complete the pharmacy curriculum. Students who are interested can take that course, get familiarized with uh, these herbal-based uh, products and herbal remedies. Okay, and uh, in my second part, I will be talking about the research. So the first part is primarily focusing on cancer statistics and chemo prevention, chemo prevention and also emphasizing a little bit on the herbal products. Okay, so in my second part, you'll be seeing me talking about my research uh, employing uh, alpha sandalol, focusing on the animal model. Uh, I'll talk about all those uh, details in my second part. So let's look into some of the aspects of cancer statistics um, throughout the world. Uh, where do uh, where do we see these cancers predominantly uh, kind of seen? You know, what type of cancers are highly diagnosed? So what are the incidences of these various types of cancers? Uh, the remainder of my presentation will be focusing on prostate cancer and the research that I've been part of for the past um, 17 years. 
Uh, I did uh, research employing various cancer models. So I started working on prostate cancer from 2007. So it's roughly 13 years prostate and breast cancer. And prior to that, um, my my graduate thesis uh, dissertation focused on colorectal cancers, and I also worked on non-melanoma skin cancer models as well. So let's get uh, some brief background about prostate gland and what is prostate cancer. Uh, you might want to recollect your information and knowledge from anatomy and physiology. So what is prostate gland uh, and what is its role in male reproductive system? Prostate gland is one of the several accessory glands that uh, we have um, in male reproductive system. And it primarily encircles the proximal pro portion of the urethra pretty much uh, present below the urinary bladder. And that's the reason why individuals who suffer from what we call enlarged prostate gland or benign prostate hyperplasia, they tend to have uh, difficulties in urinating because the enlarged gland is pushing the urinary bladder and they're not able to completely widen their urinary bladder because of this enlargement. So that's totally different from prostate cancer. So we will not be uh, spending uh, any further time talking about um, benign prostate hyperplasia, but we'll be spending time talking about prostate cancer. Uh, again, just a uh, uh, brief information about prostate gland. Uh, typically, the gland undergoes two growth spurts. The first growth spurt occurs uh, when men, or I should say uh, males, are in their adulthood and then the second growth spurt occurs when men are in their late 40s so typically the size is not very big so of a walnut size um, but it can be much larger in um, elderly men and here is the location of prostate gland uh, again from your anatomy and physiology knowledge so you can see prostate gland and the urinary bladder uh, how it is encircling the uh, urinary bladder and how urethra is kind of um, passing through the prostate. Prostate gland is kind of surrounding the urethra and also the urinary bladder is on the um, on the upper side of the prostate gland. So prostate cancer typically arises when the cells in the prostate gland they start to grow uncontrollably and please again refresh your memories from the various risk factors we talked about how cancer can arise a prostate cancer has some familial tendency and ethnic background associated with it typically individuals with uh, african descent they are more susceptible to the developing of prostate cancer in their later parts of the life compared to other ethnic backgrounds in, in the United States, we tend to have a lot of uh, African American population, and that's why we tend to see a lot of these cancers. And again, going back to our world statistics, we did see a lot of countries in Africa also uh, kind of having this particular type of cancer. So, uh, um, just uh, giving you some details about prostate cancer, um, as what we just saw, the cancer arises when the cells in the prostate gland start to grow uncontrollably. Um, other than skin cancer, and again here skin cancer, I mean to talk about non-melanoma skin cancer, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in American men. So, and what we have seen in the statistics, it's the most commonly diagnosed cancers in the United States. And the number of cases expected in 2020, a uh, little over 191,000 or more like 91,000 uh, new cancer cases, prostate cancer cases are expected to be diagnosed and roughly around 33,000 deaths are expected to uh, come from prostate cancer in 2020. One of the commonly used treatment approaches for treating prostate cancer is androgen withdrawal. Remember I talked about uh, how prostate cancer and breast cancer can be both hormonal dependent and hormonal independent. So here we're talking about a cancer, prostate cancer, that is typically developing in the presence of androgens. So if you take off androgens from the body or you are giving certain agents which are limiting the, uh, I should say, the conversion of androgens to dihydrotestosterone or you are giving uh, 
what we call androgen blockers or antagonists for androgen receptors. So, in essence, you are blocking the androgen signaling from further proceeding so that they are not able to um, replicate cellular growth and proliferation. So that's one of the commonly uh, used treatment approaches in the earlier stage because the cancer is typically dependent on androgens. But the main problem is uh, it is very palliative and the disease often records so it's not a complete cure. So may at the beginning individuals might be having a little relief from androgen withdrawal, but uh, it, the disease is going to come back. It's not going to be completely cured uh, by just uh, you know, shutting off androgens in the body. So the other two approaches, chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents, the various types that again from your um, oncology classes you might all see and uh, talk a lot about uh, what we call alkylating agents, uh, vincristin, vinblastin, those microtubule inhibitors, paclitaxel, docetaxel, several agents, right? Depending upon the situation, um, we have uh, as what we have uh, intercalating agents, uh, DNA alkylating agents, we have methotrexate, various types of agents which are classified as chemotherapeutic agents. So that's one approach and the other approach is radiation therapy. Radiation therapy is not commonly seen in the early part of this uh, disease development because it is typically kind of um, uh, used at a later stage when the when the cancer is relatively bigger in its uh, when the cancer is uh, grown in um, relatively bigger size that's when radiation therapy is used to prevent the spread of cancer to surrounding tissues and these two approaches are also very ineffective especially in the advanced prostate cancer because uh, remember cancer when it progresses into stage four, it is going to spread to other parts of the body. That's what we call metastasis of the cancer can occur. So that's going to be very ineffective when the cancer has spread to other parts of the body. Uh, one other important point that you want to know about prostate cancer, it, it is usually diagnosed in later um, stages of our life, in men especially, right? So women don't have prostate glands, so they will not be developing prostate cancer. So men in their sixth and seventh decades of life, they tend to develop uh, prostate cancer. So now that they have 60 years of age, like prior to sixth and seventh decade of life, there is so much that you can intervene. Maybe you can modify dietary intake. You can modify their lifestyle if you can educate them how alcohol consumption, how smoking can lead to development of various types of cancers, including prostate cancer. And you can also intervene and in asking them to kind of modify their diet, you know, eating um, more vegetables, eating more uh, fruits, things like that. So that's going to help them in preventing the disease development. Or maybe they can also even, who knows, they can also reverse the disease from getting developed. And this is very pertinent, especially to those individuals who have um, familial tendency of developing cancer. So because someone in the family have had cancer at some point in their life, now we know that, you know, you know whoever in the, in, is there in that family, they might also, may or may not, right? So just going going on the um, positive side, so if you were to intervene and then, um, you know, make those changes. So here we're talking about prevention. Always remember, prevention is better than cure. So then if you can prevent a problem from occurring, you don't even have to worry about a cure. And that's what you might be uh, again uh, seeing a lot about uh, COVID-19 coronavirus. So you want to prevent from getting exposed to people who might have got infected. So if you can prevent that, you're not going to develop the COVID-19 disease. You know, you're you are kind of approaching the prevention there as a strategy to mitigate the development of the disease there. So that's the reason why there is an important. Uh, you know, need for developing some of these agents that are typically coming from nature so that they can be used to delay onset and development of uh, prostate cancer. So that's what I'm going to talk about, these herbal products and the phytochemicals. So the approach that is typically used to, to prevent cancer development by using these natural products or some synthetic or uh, semi-synthetic compounds is identified as chemo prevention because this approach can 
not only prevent the disease from developing, they can also sometimes reverse the disease progression. So here I'm going to focus more about herbal products and also the naturally occurring phytochemicals because that's what my research is all um, all about talking um, these phytochemicals. So here I'm going to show you some of the phytochemicals that I have worked with um, and you can see some of the publications that uh, resulted from my research using these phytochemicals and you can also uh, refresh your memories from what you have learned in the, in pharmacognosy. So there are so many medicinal plants, so many um, medicinal products uh, you know are, are derived from these medicinal plants so that's why we call them as supp dietary supplements or herbal flower products. So here you can see some of the images are shown. Watercress, broccoli is, uh, is a, I would say, it's similar to cauliflower, you can see, but this is a cruciferous vegetable. It also belongs to the same family as cauliflower and cabbage. And the other one is Brussels sprouts. These are teeny tiny kind of small cabbage like sprouts. Uh, like uh, plant products and garlic so we all know the importance of garlic uh, leek, leeks and chives so I have used compounds from all these cruciferous vegetables and you can see these names here phenethyl isothiocyanate, PITC, benzoyl isothiocyanate um, and sulforaphane so those are the important phytochemicals coming from these cruciferous vegetables and from the alien vegetables like garlic dialyl trisulfate, dialyl disulfate, ajoin. Those are all the various compounds or if you will phytochemicals that you can think of coming from these uh, plant-based uh, products. And you can think of uh, other products like uh, you know curcumin, you know we pretty much use turmeric right so we pretty much use in our household you know compounds from green tea polyphenols you know epigallocatechin, all these catechins you know, um, so there, there are so many of them. So I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I'm just going to focus on a couple of them here because that's what I have worked. With. My my research um, employing these compounds started when I was doing my postdoctoral research work at University of Pittsburgh for two years. Um, I was extensively involved with prostate and breast cancer models, both cell culture and animal models, and published uh, uh, close to eight articles during the two-year period. So that was a very productive time when I was working as a postdoc at Pittsburgh. So moving on, what I'm doing right now um, and why why I'm interested in this compound uh, called as alpha sandlot. Probably some of you will know, or I should say majority of you know, about sandalwood, right? Sandalwood, we use it, sandalwood oil is there. So this compound is extracted from sandalwood oil. So we purchase the oil commercially and then we extract the compound using uh, uh, chromatographic techniques. Okay, so Color chromatography is what we use to extract alpha sandalol from sandalwood oil. So it is traditionally used for various skin ailments and we still continually continue to use these, these uh, compounds and products from sandalwood oil uh, for various um, ailments and anxiety disorders. So the anti-cancer properties of alpha sandalol uh, are also well documented in non-melanoma skin cancer models and I was also involved in those studies. <clears throat> this was part of my, uh, it was not my dissertation but while working on my dissertation I was also able to focus on these couple of other studies uh, emphasizing the role of alpha sandalol on um, non-melanoma uh, skin cancer. So that was the basis for alpha sandalol to be used uh, in what I am doing right now, employing prostate cancer model. So what I have completed so far, you can see uh, we published uh, all the cell culture uh, results. So so far we were able to conclude that alpha sandalol induces what we call a type of cell death called apoptosis, right? So again, just refreshing your knowledge about what is apoptosis. Majority of the chemotherapeutic agents that we typically use in treating cancer, the main goal of these agents is to induce apoptosis because cancer cells, they tend to lose the machinery that is essential for executing apoptotic pathway. 
So these calm bombs, you know, they have the ability to reignite the process of apoptosis in the cancer cells, and selectively they are going to kill only cancer cells at, while not doing any harm to the normal cells. So that's the beauty of these natural products. So because chemotherapeutic agents, they can kill cancer cells and also healthy cells. So they are not going to discriminate between these healthy cells and cancer cells. So that's the drawback by using chemotherapeutic agents. There are a lot of side effects, you know, unwanted or undesirable side effects associated with these chemotherapeutic agents. So when it comes to the natural products, they are taking care of the cancer cells. At the same time, you're not going to see any side effects associated with these compounds. So that's what we are really interested when we talk about these naturally occurring phytochemicals. So we did find that uh, alpha sandalol induces apoptosis in prostate cancer cells in both androgen-dependent and androgen-independent type of cancer cells. Right? We did explore some of the key molecular pathways that this compound is attacking. One important uh, pathway is PA3K AKT pathway. So AKT is, a, is one of the important kinases that is highly upregulated in cancer cells including prostate cancer. So if you can block the activity of this important kinase, you can limit the survival and proliferation of cancer cells. So this kinase is pretty much essential in guiding cellular proliferation. So here we're talking about blocking the kinase and preventing cellular progression and growth. Right, so alpha sandalol mediated apoptotic cell death, what we also saw was enhanced in the presence of a known inhibitor of the pathway, PA3K, AKT pathway. So here we are talking about what we call synergism and additive effects. So the reason why we tend to use multiple agents together is to achieve a therapeutic effect that would be higher than the individual agents alone. So very important point that you need to know um, why we sometimes have to use two or more agents together to achieve a, um, and increase therapeutic benefits. Um, some brief uh, background about apoptosis. Again, um, probably you might have learned about it in your classes. So apoptosis means uh, falling off, right? So it's a, it's a Greek word, uh, basically pinching off and then um, getting eliminated from the body. So it's a process of programmed cell death. The, the important point that you want to know about apoptosis is it is confined with a single cell. So when the process associated with apoptosis is initiated, it is going to only be affecting that one cell where the um, process has, has started. It is not going to affect the other cells, unlike, unlike necrosis. So necrosis is basically affecting everything that is, that is there where the process is occurring. So it is going to affect normal cells. It's going to affect cancer cells. So anything can be necrotic. But if you can confine the cell death only to one single cell, you are focusing on those cells that you want to get rid of, which is uh, what we are interested in cancer treatment. So the process of apoptosis typically occurs in two different pathways, intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway. And here you can see the machinery that is associated with execution of apoptosis. So intrinsic pathway, all these caspases, all these key enzymes are activated when you have an upstream um, regulator of the pathway getting activated. And subsequently, uh, these are going to execute apoptosis in that single cell. Um, here you can see some of my students uh, are learning techniques of uh, cultivating the cells in the, in the lab. Here we're working inside the um, laminar flow hood. Aseptic techniques are important in culturing cells. Uh, we culture them and then uh, we treat the cells, we collect them. That's how we process the cells to understand what's happening uh, when we treat these cells with our compound So, Just to give you an idea of what goes uh, behind what you're going to see in a minute. So as I said, I uh, very briefly showed you what we have um, uh, published so far using the cancer cells, prostate cancer cells, how apoptosis is induced and uh, what kind of uh, targets are commonly seen with alpha sample treatment. So, so far so good, right? 
because here we're talking about individual cells and it is good to see that happening in the cells. But when it comes to an intact organism, it's not just one single cell type that we have in the body. We have multiple types of cells, several, several thousands, millions of those cells. So how is this effect that you see in, in cells getting translated into an intact organism? So that's, that's what we need to know. You know, anything can be affected in cell culture, but when it comes to animal model, it might, it might not get translated. So that's the reason why several compounds which have been shown to have great success in preclinical studies fail to get into clinical trials or even in animal studies because the work cannot get translated into an intact organism. So that's what we wanted to see here. So we hypothesize that alpha-sandalol inhibits prostate tumor development in a transgenic mice model called tramp mice by inhibiting cellular proliferation and inducing apoptotic cell. So based on our uh, preliminary studies, that's, that's what uh, we kind of hypothesized. And our aims were to mainly uh, understand the efficacy of alpha sample administration on uh, the development of prostate cancer in male tramp mice and understanding the mechanisms by which our compound is, uh, if at all, inhibiting the growth of prostate tumors. So uh, this is the animal study protocol that we used. So what we did was we purchased five to six week old tramp mice uh, and then we divided them into two groups, nine group uh, per uh, nine mice per group. Um, again, we had only three mice per cage so that uh, they would not be fighting e with each other. And as I said earlier, um, we collected uh, or we extracted alpha sandal from from sandalwood oil using flash column chromatography. And uh, whatever we obtained, we again uh, made sure by using a GC mass spec, made sure the ex the uh, extracted uh, product is indeed alpha sample. So you need to perform all those analysis. So right. So, and when once we confirmed all those uh, details, we started treating the mice um, at uh, roughly six week old, right? And then we continued treating them three times per week for 20 weeks, intraperitoneal administration. So we injected them um, uh, intraperitoneally. And remember, alpha sandlol is highly hydrophobic, meaning it is not soluble in water, right? So that's why we developed a formulation by using a twin AD saline. So, and then we made like a my micelle formulation. It's not completely miscible there. Uh, but we were able to see the mice cells uh, being formed there. So that's what we injected the mice uh, and then sacrificed them when they were 20, between 26 and 28 weeks of age, depending upon how big the tumor was in these some of these mice. And then we collected all uh, these organs, vital organs for um, our analysis part. So let's look into some of the results that we got uh, from this study. And so you, you can see this graph basically is showing uh, if alpha sandalol administration had any effect on the body weight of the mice. So remember, anything that is given to an intact organism could be toxic. And if it is toxic, the mice, you know, they don't want to eat food, you know, they might not be feeling good about it. So those are the side effects we are talking about with chemotherapeutic agents. So but comparing with the control, treated mice, um, there was no significant difference in terms of the weight loss, so indicating that alpha santalol that is given 100 milligrams per kilogram body weight was not toxic to them, so they did not have any problem um, in taking alpha santalol in their body. So incidence of uh, prostate tumors in these mice, so how alpha santalol affected, so tumor incidence means if you have a tumor, whether it is relatively bigger in size or smaller in size, it doesn't matter. As long as there is a tumor, it means there is prostate cancer there. So comparing the control versus alpha sample group, you can clearly see five out of the nine mice that we had in the control group developed uh, prostate tumors. And uh, one out of nine mice in the alpha sample group developed prostate tumors. So there is a significant difference in terms of tumor incidence. Uh, by the way, I forgot to talk uh, about tramp mice. So I did mention that these mice are transgenic mice. So what does it mean? It means that they have an inbuilt viral oncogene 
uh, inserted in the prostate gland when once they attain certain age of their life I would say roughly 13 to 15 weeks when they are at that time 13 weeks of their life they tend to develop prostate tumors because of this viral oncogene so these mice are transgenically modified to develop those tumors and that's why they, they become a a very good model to study uh, especially for preventative studies because when you when you already know that your tumor is going to develop if you intervene early on you can clearly see if the intervention prevented the development of the tumor or not so that's how the mice model uh, is, is going to be very helpful in these preventative studies <clears throat> so let's look into the um, the prostate tumor weight remember if if the gland uh, grows bigger in its size into a tumor, it's going to weigh substantially, uh, you know, heavier compared to a normal prostate gland. So that's what we are seeing here. Comparing the control treated mice with the genital genital urinary tract, that's what GU means, uh, with the alpha central treated group, roughly uh, the GU weight of control group was 1.25 grams compared to uh, close to 0.25 grams in the alpha central treated group, which again clearly proves the point that prostate tumor development was clearly um, reduced in alpha central treated mice. On the right side, you can see the prostate weight comparing the uh, control versus alpha central group, and you can clearly see how the prostate. Uh, I should say the genital urinary tract. It has seminal vesicles, it has urinary bladder and prostate gland. Prostate gland is so small um, in the mice you cannot clearly um, separate it, right? So, if, and you can imagine if there is a big tumor, you know, how much it can weigh. So you can see the inflammation in the control compared to um, compared to alpha santal treated group. <clears throat> then we are interested to see uh, if uh, proliferation is indeed happening in the prostate gland. So what we did was we isolated the, the organs and prostate gland, prostate tumors, and then we subjected them to HND staining, hematoxylin and eosin staining, which are pretty commonly used to detect the, the cells. So comparing the control and alpha sample, uh, here you can see increased uh, magnifications, 40X, 100X, and 400X. So Clearly, in the control group, you can see a lot of those darkly stained cells. Uh, there are a lot of them, and you can barely see a normal prostate gland in the control group compared to alpha sample. And an alpha sample treated group, the prostate glands are still intact. Um, there are few um, cells that seem to be in the process of undergoing replication, but comparing to the control group, the number of those cells are fewer. Very important point understanding how uh, the proliferation is getting affected in these tumors, and that's how the tumor development is hindered in alpha central treated group. So, next we proceeded to see uh, the markers that are associated with cell proliferation. So, it's good to see that there are more cells proliferating in the control group, but how can you prove that these cells are indeed proliferating? So, for that, we used an important uh, cell proliferation marker called KI67. This is a neuroendocrine marker which typically uh, stains as brown color in rapidly proliferating cells. The number of those cells are predominantly higher in control group compared to alpha sample or treated group. Again, clearly uh, proving that uh, cell proliferation is higher in control group compared to alpha sample or treated group. Uh, we also looked into uh, how exactly uh, the, the, the cells, you know, the number of cells are different in control versus alpha. What is happening, you know, or why there are fewer cells proliferating in alpha central all treated group. So what we found was there are more number of cells undergoing apoptosis in alpha central all treated group compared to control treated group. Clearly again proving the point that those cells uh, which might be in the process of undergoing proliferation are not undergoing proliferation, but indeed are undergoing apoptotic cell death, which is what we want to see um, in treating cancer. So that's what uh, we, we, all those brown stained cells, 
is an indication of apoptotic uh, cells or cells undergoing apoptosis. Next, we proceeded to see uh, if we can um, identify those markers that I talked about in our you know, cell culture studies. They can be replicated in this animal model. We were able to clearly see some striking differences in alpha sandlot treated group compared to the control group. Some of those markers for cell cycle uh, replication, cyclin D, CDC2, surviving, those are all essential for cells to undergo replication and proliferation. You can clearly see the intensity of the bands, which is again clear indication of the expression of these proteins in those cells. Clearly higher in control treated group compared to alpha sample of treated group. And a few other markers we also looked into CRAF. CRAF is an important uh, uh, kinase, again essential for cell proliferation. The, it's also uh, down regulated in alpha sample of treated group. XIAP is an important protein that negatively controls apoptosis. So if you have higher expression of uh, this protein, it means that it is helping the cells to survive and replicate. If you do not have the expression of this protein, it is an indication that apoptosis is indeed occurring. And then PCNA is another marker for uh, proliferating cells. So it stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen. And again, clearly down-regulated in alpha sample treated group. And finally, we have uh, actin. Actin is a housekeeping uh, marker. Uh, you don't want to see any differences in actin because you want to make sure that you are using the same amount of protein, but yet seeing either upregulation or downregulation of the protein that we are probing, which is uh, which is an indication to express uh, what is happening in those cells. So to conclude our animal study, uh, we did find that administration of alpha santalol indeed decreased the incidence of tumors, 11% in alpha santalol treated group compared to 55% in the control group, uh, a clear, uh, clear um, indication that alpha santalol indeed prevents the development of tumors, prostate tumors. And finally, uh, analyzing uh, histological and analyzing the tumors and the samples we collected, we were able to see that alpha santalol decreased tumor burden and poorly differentiated tumors in the dorsal lateral prostate of transgenic mice, the tramp mice, to, uh, compared to the control mice. So the, the histological HND staining slides I showed, those were the cross sections of the dorsal lateral prostate, uh, prostate that we collected from um, both the control and the, on the alpha santalol treated group. Typically, this is the side of the prostate that tend to be more so associated with uh, prostate cancer. So that's the main reason why we did look into those sections. And finally, alpha sandalol mediated inhibition of prostate carcinogenesis was associated with induction of apoptosis. We saw the markers for apoptosis, decreased cell proliferation, and decreased expression of those uh, important proteins essential for cell cycle and proliferation there. So pretty promising study uh, that we had there with alpha sandalol and uh, transgenic mice cramp. Uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge some of these uh, people who helped me with my study. Several students helped uh, in taking care of the mice. It's not an easy job to handle mice, treating them, changing their cages, and uh, all those, all those um, you know, uh, details associated with animal handling. and. Um, Support from uh, Wilkes University in uh, um, uh, completing this study. So they were very helpful uh, with that uh, study. That's all I have. Um, again, um, we'll be here. Dr. Rahman is here. So uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm more than happy. Um, and if you have any other questions not related to my presentation, please feel free to talk. I'm more than happy to answer. Thank you, sir, for such a nice and beautiful presentations. You have got lot many questions, but we need to filter some of the questions in order to accommodate in the time frame. So here I have the first question, and it is: Is there any specific reason for the selection of alpha centolol for carrying out research in the treatment of cancer? So 
the reason why I selected alpha sandlot for carrying out my research is uh, two main things, okay? One, a practical experience using alpha santalol with other animal models as i mentioned in my talk i did i did have experience working on non melanoma skin cancer models using alpha santalol and with my experience on prostate and breast cancer models at university of pittsburgh i decided to use alpha santalol because no one else uh, was working on these cancer models using alpha santalol so that was the uh, th those were the two main reasons my prior experience working with alpha santalol and my background with prostate and breast cancer models and combining those two things together made me to go with alpha santalol and start uh, um, finding out the results you know whether it is it is good or not in preventing a prostate tumor development next question is is tramp mice model specific to study prostate cancer what is the usual cost of tramp mice just to have an idea about the initial cost of animal experimentation so tramp mice model is very specific to prostate cancer as the name indicates t strand stands for transgenic uh, TR, I should say, stands for transgenic, A stands for adenoma of, M stands for mouse and prostate. Transgenic adenoma of mouse prostate cancer mouse model. This is a GEM, genetically engineered mice model that is typically used to see if the compound has any preventative properties associated with it. As I already discussed, this mice model tends to develop tumors when they are 13, between 13 and 15 weeks of age. Um, later, I'm going to show you a slide how you can clearly understand, you know, by, by just intervening, how you can say that uh, the compound that you are investigating, whether it is preventing tumor development or whether it is reducing the tumor that is already developed. So the usual cost for tramp mice, um, you can procure them from commercial suppliers. I purchased my my mice um, from Jackson Laboratories. They are pretty expensive. You know, two, I, I believe I, I paid, this was done uh, a year and a half ago. At that time, I paid close to $270 per mouse. And I used 18 mice for the whole study. But there is another way of going around and working around the price here. The, the way... Um, because ours is not a research-based uh, institution, we do not have that kind of manpower or facilities to perform these studies. But if you were to start all along, you can purchase uh, a male and female mice, female mouse, and then you can breed them and uh, uh, test the pups that are born if they have the expression of this transgene, which is T antigen. And if it is tested positive, you can use that mouse in the study. So that's another way of going out uh, um, if you don't want to purchase individually. But as I said, it, in, it, it involves a lot of uh, time and a lot of commitment. You need to have people you know, dedicated to breeding the mice and then collecting the pups, performing those PCR analysis to confirm the transgene, whether it is expressed or not. If the transgene is not expressed, then you cannot use those mice for the study. Next question we have, what are the other animal models to study prostate cancer? I will divide the animal models that are typically used for any cancer. You know, it's not just prostate cancer alone. You can use these mouse models for any type of cancer. The first one is called chemical carcinogenesis model. The second one is called xenograft or athymic mice model. And the third one, which we uh, kind of covered in the talk, the transgenic mice models, those are called genetically engineered mouse models. Those are the three important uh, models that you can use uh, for performing any type of cancer study. So I'm going to talk about more cancer models uh, in the next slide, but uh, for, the, for the sake of the question, 
let's get get back to some of the tra uh, transgenic mice models that are currently available. So we have tramp mice. There are other models like a P10 knockout mice model. P10 is a housekeeping or protective gene which checks the activity of PA3 kinase, all right, in the in the body. So which means that it has a control, negatively controls the activity of PA3 kinase. But in cancers, PA3 kinase is overtly activated or upregulated, meaning that P10 can no longer possess that protective benefit. So if you were to create a mice model where you are going to lose the functionality associated with P10, right? That obviously is going to lend to the development of prostate tumors. So that's another model, P10 knockout model. There are other mice models like uh, activating a MIC model. See, MIC is an oncogene. If it is activated just like our tramp mice, they can also develop a lot of uh, polyps and tumors eventually. And there are other mice models which I did not use, but I came across in literature, retinoblastoma uh, inactivation uh, model. Just like P10, retinoblastoma is also housekeeping gene or tumor suppressor gene. So if you knock out the function associated with retinoblastoma, then they will, the mice will no, no longer have the protective benefit and then they will develop prostate tumors. Okay. Next we have, can we develop prostate cancer in rodents by chemical means? If yes, which model would you like to prefer, tramp mice or animal model of chemical induction? Those are some of the models. So in this slide, I'll talk more in detail uh, how you can use those three models I talked about in the previous slide. Chemical carcinogenesis model, uh, xenograft mice model, and then the genetically engineered mice model. So as I said, we can uh, develop prostate cancer in rod rodents by chemical means. So you will be starting with uh, what we call an initiating agent, and then you will be using sometimes a promoting agent. Okay, so if you recall what I talked in my presentation, uh, if you were to expose the body to certain chemicals, uh, prolonged and uh, repeated exposure to high concentrations of some, some of these uh, chemicals like polyaromatic hydrocarbons, all right, uh, NNKs, those are the carcinogens derived from nicotine or the smoke, I should say. Um, and there, there are other, other uh, chemicals like DMBA, dimethyl benzanthracene, one of the chemicals that is commonly seen in coal tar. So those are some of the commonly used chemicals that are used for initiating chemical carcinogenesis. So let me uh, talk about this picture and then I'll get back to the second part of the question. So if you were to see here, when you were to treat the mice with the chemical, or here you're seeing the uh, the, um, the pointer, um, which is like a, a, an indication showing that a chemical is, is being, uh, you know, given to the animal, whether it is orally gawazing or whether you are applying it to the body. So what the chemical does is it is going to create damage to DNA and this cell that has damaged DNA is waiting for another chemical, which is the promoting agent. When once the promoting agent is there, that's how the damaged DNA cell is going to proliferate and then eventually develop into um, adenoma and subsequently carcinoma, where it is going to progress to the next phase of the uh, carcinogenesis, which is progression, which is going to, uh, again, metastasize and then invade to the surrounding tissues. So chemical carcinogenesis works like this. So if you want to know whether a compound has the ability to prevent uh, prevent cancer development, you are going to subsequently or, or simultaneously, I should say, uh, give that agent to the animal and then you can see if the damage to DNA was prevented or if it prevented the cells from undergoing proliferation. So that's why you are seeing the chemo prevention protocol applies pretty much early on where you can see initiation step being blocked or suppressing the progression step or proliferation step. So chemical carcinogenesis model is good for identifying uh, chemopreventive agents efficacy. If you want to see the therapeutic effect, here we're talking about a tumor that is already established. So that time you can use xenograft mice models. In xenograft mice models, what happens is 
you can inject certain tumor cells. So for convenience sake, we're talking here about prostate cancer. So you're going to inject uh, like LM cap cells and then the mice will develop tumors. Then you will start treating the mice with the compound that you are working with and see if the compound regressed the tumor size or not. There you can identify whether the compound is having therapeutic benefit or not. So we are not only uh, identifying the chemo prevention approach, but you can also study the therapeutic benefit. And tramp mice are, are useful in chemo prevention studies again. Transgenic mice, they are developing the tumor. You're not dealing with any chemicals here. They will develop tumors by themselves because of that inbuilt oncogene that is already there in the body. So the compound, if it has any ability to block the tumor development, which is what we saw in my presentation, alpha santalol blocked the development of tumors. So that's why it has that preventative properties and then preventing the development of prostate tumor in tramp mice. Which model would you like to prefer, tramp mice or animal model by chemical induction? Uh, as I said, depending upon the type of study that you want to see, you can use either of those two models. But chemical carcinogenesis model is a little bit time consuming compared to the transgenic mice. And of course, transgenic mice, depending upon how you are, you know, have developing your mice, it could be a little bit expensive, you know. So those are some of the factors you want to take into consideration cost benefits, and then time, you know, time frame. So to go with the, the question, I would prefer tramp mice because of the convenience associated in conducting the mice model. Um, and the mice typically develop tumors, whereas in chemical carcinogens, sometimes you might not be seeing the development of tumors, um, you know, um, when, you, when you induce the, the chemical carcinogens. The next question we have is, which cell lines were used for the alpha santalol study? Could you please share your views on the cell culture medium and other components you have preferred in your study? I did use two different uh, uh, prostate cancer cell lines. Uh, one is Allen cap, uh, which is derived from lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. And the other cell type is PC3, which is derived from bone metastasis of prostate cancer. It is very easy to work with these cancerous cells which have metastasized to a distant organ because there you are seeing a bunch of cancerous cells growing and developing into a solid tumor. So it is easy to isolate the tumor cell, you know, perform the biopsy and collect the cells and then uh, regrow and, and start culturing them. It is not an easy thing to collect the tumor cells directly from prostate gland because these cancer cells are also occupied, are also mixed up with so many of the other type of cells that are there in the prostate gland. Whereas in the metastatic, metastatic organ side, you're only seeing these cancer cells that have uh, invaded to that side and then started to grow. Some of the important things that you need to culture these cells are you need uh, what we call culture medium. We need uh, um, fetal bovine serum, which is the nutrient medium that is typically um, supplementing the nutrition for the growth of these cells. You will be needing uh, uh, antibiotic mixture, penicillin, streptomycin, and eumycin, a uh, combination of antibacterial, antifungal uh, antibiotics there, so that you are protecting the cells from having any contamination. Typically, we procure all these components from commercial source uh, because it is not an easy thing to again, produce them in the lab. Um, it's also, again, inexpensive getting them from commercial source than making it uh, in, our, in our facility itself. The last question we have is, in your study, mice were preferred. Is it for a specific reason? Can we develop such models using male SD rats and Vista rats? Yeah, the reason why I preferred mice in my study is, uh, again, all the genetically engineered mo uh, modified gem models are typically developed in the mice because they are very easy to work with. And uh, you know, a lot of these mice models are more superior as genetic models compared to rats. 
But now that we are able to, you know, edit the genes of mice, rats, or other other animal models, you can use both the uh, rat models and also mice models as such. So Sprague Dolly rats can be used, Vistar rats, they can be used. These, these rats are typically used for chemical carcinogenesis model, but you can also, uh, as I said, you can also modify the gene and then make them as a gem model. But uh, um, mice models are much more easier to work with, those transgenic models compared to the uh, rats. But, but uh, to, to, um, to give you a perspective between mice and rats, rats are much more easier compared to mice and they have similar profile as that of humans. So, you know, it's easier to mimic whatever you see in a rat model and then take it to human, human um, samples. Thank you, sir, for such a nice and beautiful presentation and guiding the research instincts of the upcoming students. We'll be moving to the next session where we'll discuss about the international opportunities for Indian pharmacy professionals. Let's uh, switch gears to career-oriented uh, questions. So various career opportunities for BPharm students in, in, the, in, the, in the United States. Um, you might already be knowing some of these things, but I'm going to reiterate them again uh, just to confirm what you already know. Uh, if someone is interested in pursuing higher education, of course, they got to uh, take their um, GRE graduate uh, recognition exam and then TOEFL or IELTS uh, just to test for the English proficiency. And when once you, you are in the United States, you, you will be, of course, given the admission to master's or PhD. And after completion of those academic credentials, of course, you have a lot of career opportunity. But to start right away from, from India with the B-Pharmacy, um, you should be having some kind of experience, maybe working at an industrial setting or in a quality control you know, department or something like that. You can, you can um, come to the United States on a work visa, but uh, um, I don't know, Coming, to, coming from India with the B-Form directly, uh, you will be get, getting like a job right away. You have to have a sponsor or an employer who can give you a job, okay? But otherwise, it's easier to come to United States on a student visa and then pursue your master's or PhD, and then you can, uh, um, you can think about your career when once you are in, in your master's or PhD here. There are no exams that you need to take to qualify uh, for joining in an industry or academic. The only examinations I mentioned in the previous uh, question is you have to take uh, the corresponding um, graduate exams and IELTS TOEFL for securing admission in master's or PhD program. Okay, and to join industry, again, you don't have to take any exam. Um, if you can find a sponsor or an employer who is ready to give you work visa, you are good to go. You don't have to worry about anything else. So your H-1B visa will be sponsored by them, and then they will be um, they will be um, taking care of your um, your status here. As as we see nowadays, right? There are so many Indian pharmaceutical companies that are really big in genetic generic. Uh, generic side of the of the pharmaceutical. So if you can get some experience working in a, in a pharmaceutical company and then um, succeed with your position there, they are willing to you know uh, send you to United States to work to work in their respective um, locations. Opportunities for master students in the United States. Uh, just like uh, the previous two questions, uh, similar to, to what I mentioned, you can also avail opportunities in industry, avail opportunities in academics. So you, if you are interested, again, you, you might want to apply for, for your PhD. It's easy, as I said, it's easier to come to United States on a student visa unless 
um, you know someone who can sponsor your work visa. You don't have to enroll in any course before getting into academics or industry. Um, master of specializations in pharmacy, uh, as, it's, uh, as, as you might already be knowing, some of the uh, hot areas are in the sectors of pharmacovigilance, regulatory affairs, uh, quality assurance, quality control, you know, those are the areas where you see uh, with the background in pharmacy. So those positions definitely require individuals with a background in pharmacy, unless someone has years of experience, you know. So, but otherwise, if you have a, um, a degree in pharmacy related field, then you are, um, you are more than eligible for that particular type of position. And nowadays, you might be hearing a lot about pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics. So some of these biotech companies, you know, are also working on, you know, several uh, um, formulations or um, biopharmaceuticals, I should say, which are targeting to, like, um, what, what we call here is patient-specific uh, uh, medication, you know, it's like patient oriented, which is, which is uh, basically focusing on an individual profile. If someone has uh, an overexpression of a particular enzyme, then you might want to cut down the medication so that the individual is not processing that medication then uh, having higher amounts of you know, the active metabolite in the body. So that's what is pharmacogenetics and pharmacogen, how the body is influencing the ability of a medication that gets into the body. So those are the two important fields that are great, that are gaining a lot of traction nowadays. Okay. Pursuing masters in United States, uh, you usually uh, will be given assistantship, whether it is teaching-based assistantship or research-based assistantship. You are eligible to work for 20 hours legally, which means that you get paid while you perform your um, duties, which are whichever are assigned to you, whether it is related to grading, um, you know, undergrad students, uh, um, lab activities, or some or something else related to what they are learning in class, or you know, you, sometimes you might get paid for your research thesis. Okay, so teaching assistantships and research assistantships are the type of jobs that are typically available. Um, and how many, how many, uh, how much money well, would you need to invest for a master's program? It all depends upon the school that you are applying. It can be anywhere from twenty thousand to forty thousand, or even less sometimes. So it all depends upon where you are going. You know, sometimes California has higher cost of living. So states like Texas, Florida, there might not be a lot of cost of living associated with. Uh, with, with those uh, places. So that's how it's going to be determined based on where you go and uh, what program you choose. You know, bigger institutions, sometimes they will waive all your fees. You don't even have to pay anything. And on top of that, you will be getting a stipend in the form of assist assistantship. So that's why just stay focused, uh, decide what you want to do, uh, and then concentrate on the GRE and TOEFL if you are interested in pursuing higher education in the United States or, I, I, for that matter, any other country in, you know, European countries or Australia. They, they also have similar standards as that of United States. Um, I do not believe master's students are eligible to perform pharmacist jobs at hospitals and pharmacy stores. Uh, if you want to perform a uh, job uh, duties related to pharmacies, then you definitely have to complete Farm D. Okay, so if you come here and if you want to go get into retail sector or hospital sector as a pharmacist, you have to complete Farm D, and then um, take the board exam. So if you complete Farm D here, you can take up the board exam. Uh, similarly, you know, if you are coming from India with a Farm D, you, you also are required to take uh, those uh, pharmacy graduate equivalency exams and, and then um, licensure exam after completion of the required intern hours. Okay, so yeah, you you cannot 
you cannot work as a pharmacist even if you have a master's from India. Okay. Uh, graduate students and uh, farm day students and the master students, I I believe there are a lot of opportunities in the software side. Um, I can only talk a couple of them because I'm not really into this area. Uh, you know, probably you might be learning something from your uh, curriculum, but I, I don't know much because majority of our students, they tend to seek uh, opportunities in the hospital area, uh, retail sector or industry. So I do not know a lot of my students taking up any software related job, but nonetheless, there are some, uh, for example, statistical analysis software, SAS. That's one of the commonly used softwares analyzing data pertinent to clinical trials. And there are also other areas like medical writer opportunities. Uh, there are um, where you can write uh, information pertinent to, you know, um, a medication or something to for some of these big companies or even like uh, uh, some other online companies which are primarily, you know, um, primarily developing all the information related to medications. So those are some of the areas, medical writer, uh, SAS, um, and nowadays, as I said, uh, information related to specialty pharmacies. So I guess there are opportunities in that area as well. Okay. Scope of pharmacy program in the United States uh, and other foreign countries. Uh, again, pharmacy is a healthcare field, healthcare field uh, that is evergreen, you know, especially due to the recent pandemic, there is a lot of uh, um, scope for pharmacy growth here in the United States. So several pharmacies are performing those COVID related tests. So, which means that pharmacists are uh, taking up a lot of responsibility, owning, uh, owning the the uh, responsibility for performing these tests and then um, you know pharmacists are also kind of nowadays they are billing uh, insurance companies for their services related to patient counseling and, and whatnot okay so there are so many um, opportunities here um, and uh, if you are interested in the industrial side you know as i said earlier there are so many opportunities in that side as well so if you if you have a solid foundation and if you can expand your resume or CV with, uh, you know, so many of things that whatever you can, whatever opportunities that comes your way while you are in the college, you know, just do it, you know, work with your teacher, work with your professor and see if they have anything that might interest you and gain additional experiences. That's what I mean to say. The more the experiences that you gain, the better your prospectus will be, you know, whether it is in India, whether it is in the United States or any other country. Perfect, so I am gonna stop there. That was my last question. Thank you, sir, for such a nice and wonderful presentation. And the question answer session is definitely going to motivate the young Indian minds and the Indian professionals who are planning to have a career in US and other foreign countries. Now in the end, I'd like to offer the vote of thanks on behalf of Nirmala College of Pharmacy and Nirmala Innovations and Incubation Center. I would like to thank Dr. Ajay Bhumaredi who has spent his valuable time for this international webinar in igniting young minds of the Indian pharmacy professionals. I would like to thank Nirmala College of Pharmacy the management, the principal, the staff, the coordinators and all the staff members who have been behind this wonderful international webinar session. Thank you. Thank you all.